hello, hello. Welcome, welcome to the PNNC, which is the Pacific Northwest Multicultural Festival, the inaugural one. And today we are finishing up strong with our amazing filmmakers. Um, I just want to say thank you, everybody, for being here. Um, I just want to make sure, can y'all see me? Yes. Can y'all see me in my front? Okay, good. Okay, just, <laughs> just want to acknowledge that um, I'm in New York City, as everybody else is in uh, all over the country, and just wanted to acknowledge that I'm in the middle of a, a tropical storm here, and so I don't know what everybody else may be in the middle of, but we're going to have a great discussion here today about your films. Thank you so much for submitting your films. And I wanted to just say, um, I just wanted to check in again. I feel like every, um, people are frozen. Can you all see and hear me? Yes. Can you all see and hear me? OK, great, great, great. So um, just a little bit about myself as um moderator okay thank you right now everybody's frozen on my end but i'll just keep talking until i see in the chat that it's not uh that you don't see me or hear me mm -hmm. um so my name is bianca laverne jones i'm going to be uh co-moderated with tim golden and uh, i'm going to be leading the discussion about you all's brilliant wonderful engaging and extremely um personal personal films um so I'll tell you about me and then we'll jump into the films. So I immediately want to start talking about everything that I saw. So my name is Bianca Laverne Jones. I am an actress and director here in New York City. And um, I'm going to be starting my first Broadway gig on Chicken and Biscuits. So if you're in New York City, make sure you come by and check us out on Broadway. Um, I want to have everybody go around and, int and introduce themselves. And so what we'll do is have you pass the mic, right? So um, I'm Bianca, what's been keeping me, uh, you know a little bit about me now, actress, director, and what has been keeping me alive during the pandemic is hanging out with my family, really um, eating all the different uh, fish. I've been in Miami and we've just been, my mom and I have just been exploring different snapper groupers and frying and cooking and having a great time and making different cookie recipes and my great grandmother's recipes and it has been lovely. So um, I'm gonna pass the mic to Lisa Collins. Hello everyone, thank you, Bianca. My name is Lisa Collins. I am the, um, the writer and producer of Be Careful What You Ask For, which is a uh, mm -hmm. short film about racism. And what has been keeping me um, Sane in the middle of this pandemic is less um, mainstream media, um, more arts, and um, more quiet time. And I will pass the mic to Francisco. Hey, thank you. Uh, my name is Francisco. Uh, I am a actor, director, playwright, and educator. And I directed Ophelio, a borderline story, which is about a father who is a former border patrol agent and he is being haunted uh, by the memories of all the children that he um, incarcerated and detained on the border and one thing that has been keeping me um, going i guess and uh, and and saying during the pandemic is teaching i teach at a performing arts school here in portland oregon and um, you know being able to work with my students and kind of keep art alive during the pandemic has been, it's been really special. And I am gonna pass it to Dime. Hi, I'm Dime Lo Roberts and I am a writer and media producer and director and producer. Um, and I guess I said that. I am the executive producer of Media Rights, which is a multicultural, multimedia, multidisciplinary, uh, organization that I run, and it is uh, it produced. Well, we produced um, several films 
during the pandemic, actually four of them. And two of them are Being Me in the Current America and Ophelio. And I directed Being Me in the Current America, written by Josie Seed and uh, performed by Shireen Jacobs so beautifully. And what's kept me going, I, I guess I, I, as a writer, I enjoy the the isolation, you know, um, because it, it's just a little bit more um, introspective, reflective time. But I also, my husband, my kitty, and the vaccine has really helped a lot with anxiety, for sure. And um, I have to say, I do like mainstream media and streaming a lot of films and and television shows yeah. which are just incredible now so and they're much more accessible than they were so thank you thank you for including us in this festival and i'm going to pass it on to um bobby yan hi well thanks thanks for that uh uh, my name is Bobby Yan. I am a uh, the director and writer of XX Visible. Uh, that is a short film that uh, follows one year of the pandemic from an Asian American perspective. And what I did uh, last year, well, let me see. I think for me, same what you just said, it's a little bit of isolation, a little bit of time to spend with family. And in my case, it would be my mother. You know, we kind of uh, sheltered ourselves together, spent a lot of time. Uh, she's 85 now. So a lot of wow. that is spent protecting, you know, protecting, keeping us safe. And then on a personal level, I think it was a lot of time for introspection, working on some of the shadow work on myself to get myself better, to prepare myself for living outside of the COVID world and intentions and all this stuff. And also just getting my, my body in shape. I ran like four miles every other day. So that kind of got me in a better place than before, you know, the mm -hmm. pandemic. So, you know, there's give and take for that. Uh, let's see, I shall pass it to, let me see who's on here. Uh, who else do we have? I believe it, Edgar. Edgar, Edgar, yes, pass yeah. on to Edgar. All right. <laughs> Hi, I'm uh, Edgar Garcia Chavez. I'm the writer, director, and editor for the short film, Black and White. And the short film, um, basically analyze the meaning of the words black and white in relation to race and ethnicity. So I took the, basically just a definition from the dictionary, like Webster dictionary, and then how that, uh, mm -hmm. then how that connotations have, you know, uh, in relation to race, and then the meaning of the specific meaning of the words. Um, and then when it kept me going in the pandemic, so like, a, I think like, a, one of the things that really like uh, motivate me is like when uh, the pandemic happened and then it's like uh, some social uh, protests that start happening at, uh, at that time. So one of the things that the short film came out of, of those events and I'm trying to like get it out. And, and I think one of the things kept me going and I started getting then uh, trying to be more active and more like promoting and trying to actually share the, uh, the work that I did and trying to be uh, connected more with other people and and, uh, and I think like uh, not necessarily physically I think through Zoom I think or, or through the computer I think we have done a lot and I think like this uh, the way we're doing today you know it's like usually this is done in person but this is us allowed to have different people from different places to be together at some point I think that's kind of a thing that I uh, I mean, like, uh, even though I'm in my house, you know, I've been able to like connect all other people in other levels that before it was a little bit harder because when you go to a film festival or something, you only connect with the people or at that place, you know? So, so I thought that was kind of the positive of the pandemic. Mm -hmm. And I guess, I mean, I'll pass the mic to who else? Uh, no, pass it to Tim. Oh, Tim, yeah, yeah. All right, thank you, Bianca. And my name is Tim Golden. I am an actor here in the Pacific Northwest, have been for about the past six years. I'm originally from Philadelphia, Pennsylvania. I live in Walla Walla, Washington. I have done some really good work with Kevin Jones and the August Wilson Red Door Project here in Portland. I've performed regularly in the stage play Hands Up, which is seven monologues about African Americans and their experiences with the police. I was also very fortunate to have been part of the cast of August Wilson's Two Trains Running, 
in 2018 with Passing Art Theater Company in Portland. So shout out to my Portland theater family. They've been a great uh, source of inspiration for me as I continue my journey in theater and acting. I think what's kept me going, <clears throat> excuse me, during the pandemic has been my day job of sorts. I am a college professor who teaches philosophy at Walla Walla University here in, in Walla Walla, Washington. And so I think for me, my scholarship, uh, indulging in my, my academic pursuits has kept me going. And I, although I must say, I'm just about at my wits end, really itching to get back on the stage. So I hope that comes sooner rather than later, but thank you all. And I'm very blessed to be here. Awesome. Thank you all for sharing a little bit about each of you. So something that I'm um, just kind of jumping in talking about something that I've noticed as a director and actor in America is people are beginning to decolonize themselves and decenter the white voice, right? As the lead in films, as the lead in thought is let me now tell my story. And so that's something I found a commonality with all of you. And not that we have to center this conversation around decolonization, but um, I would love for us to keep thinking around the decolonization of the mind, if I may throw that into the pot here, right? And so, um, Lisa, I would love to start with you because you put white people right at the forefront so we could try to understand what they were thinking. Right. So um, we don't have to tell anybody what the current climate is and where we were the last four years. And no matter where you stand, there is a polarization that has happened in America and some things that have come to the forefront. So, um, you know, and we'll get to that, Francisco, talking about the borderline. Right. Where Lisa, in your movie, we have we are trying to understand white people's thoughts and like how they've got money put to the side. Bobby, I loved how uh, you decided to center your story and us understand what it was from an Asian male perspective or Asian perspective and being discriminated in these streets where I was like, oh, that is a reflection directly to me of the way I've been treated as a black person, right? And then that um, deconstruction Edgar did with the black and white really awesome. And then a personalized story, Dime, from a Black woman talking about what it is to be in a white space, right? And her experience. So anyway, touching on all of your films. So Lisa, I would love to start with you and have you talk a little bit about what made you decide to, or like, what was the thought pattern to get you to start with white people and try and sitting having their dinner where they're the most relaxed it wasn't a confrontational black you know black against white but it was actually the you know um white against white you know in thought so what was that tell can you talk to us a little bit more about that yes um thank you bianca um i am originally from los angeles so i've been in the pacific northwest for 10 years and in those 10 years, um, I, I really became a Black woman, an othered woman when I moved to this area. And in that, um, I've written a dissertation on um, my lived experiences as a Black woman in the Pacific Northwest. So here I am in this bubble, like a, a fishbowl, writing about um, the organizational systemic oppression. And then this particular, um, the life is loss of um, Jason Eric Washington. And just something in me snapped where I just wrote that piece in one night and I put, um, I want to move the conversation. And when I'm the face in the Pacific Northwest, in my experience, the conversation doesn't move. Mm. But when the face becomes a light face, then people lean in in a different way. And I think that happened in this in this film, that people leaned in and listened. They were listening to words in a different way that they don't even know that they were doing. And therefore, the messages were transmitted in a different way, in a more um, interpersonal neurobiology way. 
I totally, I totally get that. So, you know, when white people write for us, right? Sometimes we're like, that doesn't quite, I can't quite fit inside of these words. I can't quite like, that's not really my language. Those are not my thoughts. That's not the way I would say this. So when you had your um, uh, white actors and forgive me, I'm not knowing if there's a better way to, um, I can say non-black but that would be, or uh, non-POC, right? Because we have like everybody here. So, um, but let's just keep it real, white people, right? So when they were sitting in your space doing those words, what were their thoughts around what you had written? Did they um, say, yeah, this is a thought that this is, you know, this this is Thanksgiving conversation. This is what my wife or my husband and I have been talking about. Honestly, um, the director, Jennifer Lanier, um, had relationships with the actors and she coached them. She, I mean, so they, they struggled. Some of the words they struggled with, like my grandfather's America or indigenous people, you mean Alaska? Like some of the, they had to get right with the conversations themselves. And I watched her, I went to every rehearsal and I watched her um, breadcrumb them to the place they needed to go. And then by the end, the performance was what we got. It was the director. Mm-hmm. 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 I, I, I woman find of that color really, director. I find that really interesting because we've got to put more. Uh, I'm I just sorry, my internet connection um, skipped me for a second. I just said she was a woman of color director, Native American and Black. Oh, okay. Sorry about that. Um, again, I, there's a tropical storm happening here. So if my internet connection goes out, I don't mean to talk over anyone. Um, I thought it was very, I thought it was very interesting to talk about um, what they have and what they're willing to sacrifice. And um, I thought it was powerful to see a white man say the names of young black mm -hmm. men and then say no, because typically when we when we hear the names of young black people, you know, the ones that have been killed, Trayvon Martin, Eric Garner, you know, George Floyd, Breonna Taylor, um, you never hear somebody say, I don't know afterward. Can you speak to um, what that meant to you to say, I don't know after their names? Um, yes. I mean, the, the first rehearsal, I cried. The second rehearsal, I cried. Um, I think being that the face is white and then saying, I don't know, is like, why are we still doing this? Why is this still happening? The oppression within our systems and the settlers colonialism that our country is built on is maintaining what it was built on. And so for him to be vulnerable and to lean into like, I don't know. Like, why is this still happening? To me, that vulnerability is um, is what we all need to lean into humanness, to oneness. So it was very, um, it was very intentional. Sorry, can you all see and hear me? Yeah. Yes. Okay, I apologize. My connection dropped and I had to come back with you. Um, Lisa, I apologize. I, I was not able to hear your last um, answer to my question. If you don't mind repeating it for me, I apologize. Sure, I'll try. Um, what I okay. talked about was the vulnerability of seeing mm -hmm. um, uh, dominant um European American figure, a man who has a lot of privilege saying saying the names and then for him to say, I don't know, like he's naming the settlers colonialism and the systemic oppression that he doesn't even understand, that he's swimming in. And to me, it's a, um, it's a juxt um, point of movement into the point of oneness in our in our community in our nation is that when we can get to the point where people are just like i don't know and then look at that systemic oppression then we are we are in a place where we can start walking together 
Mm -hmm. Sometimes I feel, and you know, this is my personal opinion and we, we can come together with this, but um, sometimes I feel like, you know, people are sitting in willful ignorance, you know, about where they are when they're talking about not knowing, you know, it's like, are you under a rock? But I wanted to um, rope you in, uh, Edgar, into this conversation to mm -hmm. just talk a little bit about your defining black and white, you know, and um, some, uh, something that stood out to me where when you had your uh, black male actor who has these strong, regular black features dip his hands in that white paint mm -hmm. and put them around his neck. <laughs> I thought that was some strong imagery, you know? Um, could you talk to us about what you may have learned from um, the white and black perspective? Well, in, in um, for this piece, like in the, I like the like what uh, Lisa was saying. It's like how to like uh, you involve other cultures and like you know white people and different like you know Asians or Latin Americans, um, and how that affects um, the, the idea of racism and stuff. So, you know the piece that I. I did as a little you know, of uh, is based on just the idea of a black and white, and it's a black male you stand in, and it's um, and then it's a voiceover just describing the words, the meaning of the words, uh, and then like the the meaning of the of the pain is when he goes to like touch the uh, the paint, the white paint is like a trying to like bridge that gap or trying to like show that it's like it's not only us against them. It's like we're all together. So in some way, we're all kind of like connected and and we have a lot more things in common than we did, that, that differences. Um, and, um, and I think that was a dip into that uh, idea of like the other the other side. In this case, it's like a tragic event you know, um, because the, the white pain kind of like end up taking his life, you know what I mean? And then and that reflects like George Floyd and, the, and so many others, you know? Um, so that's kind of like in general, like what I was trying to like see, uh, to show, but I think the, the, the film is meant to like see the black man, like as a, as a black man, you know, like, uh, his features are like strong features, you know, there's no like pointy noise or, you know, he has big lips, you know, all that. And then he's showing this, it is, he is what it is, you know, let's see if that, Okay, I think we may have lost Bianca due to her internet connection. Again, I'm sure she'll be joining us in just one second. I, I did want to ask just one question of you, which was, um, as I watched your film, I, I was reminded of <clears throat> the autobiography of Malcolm X. Mm -hmm. And Malcolm X did exactly what you did in the film which is he tells the story of how he went through the dictionary and talked a little bit. <clears throat> he talks in his autobiography about how he wrote down all the meanings of the term white and all the meanings of the term black that he got out of the dictionary, which seems to be what you did here. And I'm curious to, to find out from you, were you familiar with what Malcolm X had done um, when you wrote your film, was that part of your uh, creative process? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So I was like, I was looking at uh, Martin Luther King, and then like you know, Malcolm, you know, uh, Malcolm X as well. And I, I saw that part, and that was, that was like, um, okay, it's interesting to see how that that um, meaning of those words gets represented. And I had then the the idea how that the um, how that evolved to take that part and trying to add to current events or like to current idea of uh of what's happening in the, in the world a year ago but i think it's still you know relevant and i mm -hmm. think by bringing it up like not only the uh the words in this case uh, are not like um uh the actor is not reading it's a voiceover so it's like someone is they're coming from uh nowhere or somewhere you mm -hmm. know so um but yeah, I was I was familiar with the with that, and I was trying to like I would say add to the dialogue, add to that, and sure. uh, and 
and and and I would say I'm trying to like do it as um uh I mean I'm I'm Latin American, you know, so it's like the way I affect like uh um racism affects me di differently in different ways, but I think we all have a common ground. Um, and uh, hopefully this, you know, the, the piece was meant to have that dialogue or some kind of uh, discussion about it, you know, and trying to get people like, you know, just like, if okay. you see and then how you, how you feel about it, then, you know, and how those, uh, the specific words already have a specific meaning. And, it's, and also the words have meaning in English. <laughs> because when uh, I uh, submitted the, um, the film to festivals in, in Mexico and in Spanish and the translation, uh, something gets lost in translation as well, because the mm. words are not exactly, um, you know, some of the words like blackmail, you know, and others, and they're not uh, in, in Spanish, they, they don't have a, um, a connotation or a relation to the semiotics of the word black, you know, so I think this is kind of like a specific piece for North America. You know, I think that's kind of the the way I uh, I saw it. You know, <laughs> I see Bianca's rejoined us. I'm sorry, Bianca. I thought we may have lost you there for a second. So you did. Thank you so much for jumping in. Just tried to fill in, but yes, back to you. Thank you. No, if you can continue to support me like that, that would be so phenomenal. You know, the pangs of Zoom. I want, speaking of uh, North America and crossing the border, Francisco, can we bring you in to kind of talk about um, what was the inspiration, you know, I, um, what was the inspiration for this? Because it got so deeply, like I was like, oh my God, right? When I realized this man had had his own baby and had been locking up other people's children, but then was trying to, um, uh, the word is not reciprocate, but like give back, you know, what he took, you know, and make it right. Can you talk to us a little bit about um, your inspiration and um, just that, that separation based on the current events of America? Um, sure. So the, the script was written by um, Andrew Delao, who is a, a playwright based out of Boston, who was originally from Texas. And I had uh, worked with Andrew before um, on a different version of a play that had this character from the film, Ophelio. And uh, we workshopped this play that Andrew wrote. And, and then when it came time to like start making these short films, um, D. May, who's the uh, producer at Media Rights, contacted Andrew and said, hey, I, I saw that play and I'm kind of interested in this character and we want to make something that deals with the border. Um, what would you think about writing the script? So the play was originally actually, the film was originally supposed to be a stage play. And then when the pandemic happened, we turned it into a film. And I, I've always kind of, my work has dealt a lot with issues on the border. Both of my parents are from Texas. My grandparents are from Texas. And it, it really has kind of influenced my work as, a, as an artist. And um, this year, actually, I've been doing a lot of, of work as a, as a playwright and then as a director that has dealt with issues of the border, uh, specifically children and children that are being locked up uh, uh, and detained um, by ICE. And that was something that had drawn me to the script. And when Dime asked if I would you know, turn this into a film, yeah, for me, it was very personal. So I said, of course, and, and I have a daughter who's 10 years old. And I always kind of think, you know, as, as a parent, the, the idea of losing my child like that is just heartbreaking. And it's such like a, an important story that needed to mm -hmm. be told. So that was one of the things, I guess, that, that it, was, it was personal and also kind of a little background on, on making it. And one of the things that I just kind of want to say really quick about this film was that when we made it, you know, it was right, the pandemic was raging uh, and, you know, it was when everything was closed off. So it, it was made kind of all online. Like I was never in the room with the actors. It was all done. Um, wow. Yeah, it was all done over, uh, over uh, Zoom. And also like all this, the moments that you see with the children, all those were filmed by one of my, uh, children is my daughter's in there as well but those were all filmed by each parent filmed those so the, all the different children those were all filmed separately 
Um, we dropped off equipment with the actor and his wife who shot it, all the sound equipment, the filming equipment, uh, we dropped off to them and they filmed it. So we would have like a monitor set up. Then we would have another camera where I would be looking at the monitor from my house, giving them direction Then another camera that was actually filming it. So it really was kind of like, and I've worked a lot in um, TV and film as an actor, but it was really unlike anything that um, I have ever um, taken on. But luckily, you know, we had this brilliant actor, um, Philip, and then his wife, Trish, who uh, is also an actress, um, was the one who essentially was a cinematographer for the film and filmed all the stuff inside their house. So that was that was really lovely. I'm I'm familiar with working in that way. I was actually, you know, as directors and filmmakers, I I, I worked in that same way during the pandemic, and it it has been an awesome coming together. What you will do to, you know, pull a film together, right? Yeah. When you care so deeply about it. Something I just want to reflect to you that really struck me that was just strong imagery was seeing the faces of the kids, man, of that baby. But then like child after child, because I don't get a chance to just sit and look at a, you know, I, I definitely, I see black children because they're in my life and they're in my world, but I don't get a chance to look at um, a Hispanic child and say, oh, I'm just looking at your beautiful face, your hairstyles, your different hair, um, th your expressions in your face, just all that, that baby, just all of it. And then seeing the baby inside the father's face, it was just beautiful. It felt like what Lisa put on um, film also would say their names. I was actually able to see their faces, yeah. you know? And it felt like I was seeing the faces of the children who are being ignored and caged. And so I thank you for that. That I thought that was just so strong, you know, and, and Edgar putting, I think my, my camera went out during this time, but I heard you say something about this actor's strong face in black and white. Right. And seeing his, his features like that, it was like, who, who is this man? You never know. You know, when you see a, black man people can think from like hip hop rap star to architect you know that that person could be anybody you don't know what that person does in their lives and so i just thought that was super strong thank you so much for that work francisco i thought really it slow burned and like got me at the end you know really touched me at thank the you. end yeah, so thank you, you and Dime. So uh, Dime, going over into your world, you decided to take a deeply personal story with a Black actress and bring her into the stage. Um, something I loved about um, you pulling uh, Dime and Edgar, your two pieces together, that you did something that was a little avant-garde, abstract, inside of a theater and used um, an installation, if you will, to portray the work, right? And I thought, ooh, you know? So um, yeah, Dime, if you'll talk to us a little bit about like your, your set, that design and, um, and, and your film. Well, I, I wanna backtrack a little bit um, on uh, just the whole project. Um, basically, uh, we, as, uh, as Francisco said, we were uh, set to tour a series of monologues called The Ism Project, and we had done a full a stage production two years earlier in which we commissioned um, and, and uh, sought, um, you know, uh, so, uh, submissions for monologues that address the intersections of race orientation, gender, and national origin. And mm -hmm. so the idea was to have these conversations afterwards to, to bridge divides, right? And so uh, when the pandemic happened, we had about six towns in Oregon that we were set to tour in uh, with these monologues. And then of course, everything was canceled. And so we actually filmed two self films um, that were very low budget that dealt with anti-Asian violence and mm. hatred. And that was in May. And we had these wonderful conversations on Zoom um, via F Facebook. And then um, after that happened, and we, uh, we decided to, to, be, uh, to do 
uh, Ruega Por Mi, which was also a border story um, about a woman wanting to know what happened to her child that she was separated with. And the actress self-filmed. And, um, and then we did um, two films back to back one week after another, um, Samantha Vandemerva of Shaking the Tree Theater uh, donated her space. Now, her space was also the center, um, a refueling, if you will, station for uh, the protest during that time, mm -hmm. uh, the Black Lives Matter protests. And so uh, it was lying empty, but she was working on all this artwork. And so we filmed two different, um, two different films in five-hour sessions, essentially, um, two different times, so two five-hour sessions. And one was that diversity thing. And so we used one part of the stage to film that as in sort of a 60 minutes interview. And then we intercut with um, live action um, footage that was uh, done in four hours earlier. Uh, well, are you but, referring to the, you, you use that time to do, um, I'm sorry, being in current America. Well, yeah, I'm, I'm getting to that because this is like oh, okay. a sorry, huge sorry. project. It was a huge project. And so okay. that diversity thing we filmed uh, twice, actually, the first time there were so many issues outside in the heat. You have to understand this was during the height of the pandemic and we didn't know what mm -hmm. was happening. People were getting sick. We were mm -hmm. very concerned about safety. We were scared for our own lives basically. Mm -hmm. And during that time, the protests were happening too. And so it was a very, very tumultuous time in Portland. And mm -hmm. um, as it was everywhere, but you know, this is the circumstances that I'm getting to. And so we filmed uh, that diversity thing um, in one section twice. And then we only had a crew of four people in that, mm -hmm. including myself. Mm -hmm. And then we filmed Being Me in the Current America the following week mm -hmm. um, in five hours. And I oh, wow. saw Samantha Vandermerva's incredible paintings for this uh, series called Refuge that she was developing an installation. And so I saw that and I went, well, this is so gorgeous. And I asked her if we could use it as part of the set. And she, you know, she let us. So I have to give a shout out to her, both for the venue, but also, you know, for her beautiful artwork. And so we filmed that in five hours with four people, including, um, not including the actress. And it was, you know, we were safe, but there was also that tension. But I also wanted to make sure, you know, this piece was about um, Josie Seed's personal experience with racial profiling, working as an actress in this smaller town, Lake Oswego, mm -hmm. uh, and where, you know, the streets, the, the signs rolled, the sidewalks rolled up at 10 a.m., I mean, 10 p.m., and she was stopped twice, you know, working as an actress. And she mm -hmm. compared that with the time that she was with a white friend seen, after seeing a show, and when he was stopped, it was just such an easy experience. And she was like freaking out. Right. Mm -hmm. And um, so, so she basically, you know, wrote this incredible piece for the stage production. And then we uh, adapted it as a film and, um, and to address the, the Black Lives Matter protests that were happening too. And so um, I, I just think it was kind of all of these productions are kind of a miracle <laughs> you know, that they happened. And when a failure, uh, a failure, you know, was uh, we were thinking of, of, of adapting that I was so glad that Francisco wanted to direct it because I knew that we wanted to to bring more into it after learning, you know, the lessons that we learned with the prior productions. And so, um, you know, technically we had the sound designer, we had um, the, uh, the cinematographer who lent us her equipment and the editor um, watching on Zoom with all of us at the same time, um, all the different takes. Now you have to understand, you're seeing Zoom right now. Our view is like this through the mm -hmm. camera. So it was incredible that it even could be as good as it ended up, right? I have to give all of you kudos for um, being so brave and really taking that time out and saying nothing will stop me. I want to also give um, some time to Bobby Yan. Uh, am I saying that your last name correctly, Bobby? Could I just finish this for oh, a yeah. second? Oh, we yeah, had conversations sure. afterwards with panels on each of these films. And mm -hmm. I want to say something about how um, the town of Lake Oswego reached out 
to us and to oh, Josie wow. in particular. So I hope she doesn't mind my saying this, but the she actually had a conversation with the chief of police uh, in which he wanted to find out how he could address the problems that she had pointed out. So what we're trying to do is, you know, art, but also ways to have these conversations, these difficult conversations. So I'm sorry, Bobby, turn it over to you. No, no, no. Um, I um, thank you for that. Thank you for giving us a little insight into the process and giving us insight into um, into what what it took, who did the the background and all that. Because I asked you those questions, so thank you so much. Um, I think that is wholly empowerful that we see that there was some change actually made from the art that you did. I think that's really, really powerful. And I don't want to skip over that, that um, someone reached out to say, how can I help? You know, even if it's minuscule, <laughs> that, that, that one thing, just asking the question can really bust open the door for something later. Um, so thank you for that, d -Mac. Um, Bobby Yan, last but certainly not least, I want to ask you like budget questions. Um, like you had the most set uh, uh, different locations and um, several actors and just a camaraderie in your film that I thought was fantastic. But at the center of that was this young man and his and his mother, you know, his his ambition and how he was reaching, like he kept hitting these ceilings, you know. Um, thank you. Uh, can you talk to me about your process? Can you talk to me about your film a bit? Uh, sure. Um, well, yeah. In reference to, I will give a little shout to the to the to the team that worked on this great team, the the main actor William Lexham. I don't know if Excellent. you know him. He actually, he actually is one of the leading Asian American activists that was from all the way from last year to now is always at every protest. He has been there he since George excellent. Floyd to the anti anti Asian hate protest. He has been there. He's actually a, a real life activist who also happens to be an actor, wow. and and happened to be the best person for the role. So that's why he got the role. You know, so it's just a coincidence that this role coincides with his real life in certain ways in terms of the subject matter. And then uh, from my, yeah, he did a wonderful job. And my producer, Karen Rose Burning, she's amazing. She is a African-American creative, uh, where is she from? Not really sure where she's from, but she's amazing. Uh, Sundance winning producer that came on board to help, help me with this. Um, D Nice, our executive producer, who's an amazing DJ. He came on to support the films of a friend for many years. D Nice? D, D Nice? D -Nice is a, mm -hmm, oh, executive wow. Executive producer of our film. Oh, yes, I so, did yeah, we have, yeah, so we have a really great, team of people and you're talking about decolonization of the mind um that was all of us are in sync with that everybody involved sorry everybody involved has the same mindset and and even the actors that we got involved we, we talked to them about what the film was about and why are you doing this role you know so even even my protagonists uh, the people on the streets they were you know intently understanding because that's not who they are my actors at the end of the film where they're confronting the, the the lead and the mother uh that's not who they are but they took the time to say i will embody this role to bring out my inner karen so to speak to become this character to help be part of the solution right so mm -hmm. um i think you asked me how did it happen uh we shot this as well last year um mm -hmm. before any of this uh hashtags and the killing and the murder in, in wow. Atlanta. It was just my goal was to just uh, create a, um, a a time capsule of sorts of uh, Asian American experience during last year. You know, and, and, you it, did and, that. It, was, <laughs> and it was spurred a lot by when I first saw uh, the so-called orange one last year say Chinese virus, China virus, over and over again. I I was like this. I immediately knew. I said this is not good. This mm -hmm. is creating life-threatening issues for us. Not the people in China, but the people that look like me here in America, whether you are Asian, Asian Americans. Or not, yeah. You could you could be Latino and just look Asian and be yeah. in trouble now. So it's not even about that. It's a little deeper than that. It's just anybody looks like me, or even you know, Ecuadorians I mean, look like me sometimes. 
we're all in trouble. We're all in, and, and I knew it was going to have, it was like a foreshadowing, you know, it's my inner psychic. But anyway, it's, it was just me trying to create a time capsule of, let me just stamp this so that you remember what you said and what you caused. And I'm just foreshadowing that in the film. But in, in, the, in the process of that, I actually put everything that happened in that film, I've experienced in some way or another. Maybe not so dramatic like the ending, but I've experienced it in one way, like the grocery store thing. I experienced that last year. That happened to me, literally happened to me, right? The job experience, that literally happened to me. So what I was trying to do was not really just address uh, anti-Asian sentiment. It wasn't just that. It was to go deeper. It was to say, okay, this is, this is, this is about George Floyd. This is about racism, white like supremacy. This is about decolonizing the mind of when we're in this country, we have a choice. We have a choice to either be supporting this, this mindset or not, right? Mm -hmm. So in terms of me as a filmmaker, I, I choose to go against it. I choose to fight the problems and, and go into the source of it. So even the, the scene where we're talking about LeBron, the sports scene, a very controversial scene, and probably some people don't like my film because of my stance on LeBron. It's not about whether LeBron is a good player. It is what he did and his effect that like Obama, he is African-American. You don't like him because he took a stand as an African-American. It's not because you don't like him as a player. There's a deeper issue here. And yes. you will not acknowledge the things that he's done. You know, now I think certain people get that and a lot of people don't. A lot of people just don't get that, what I was trying to say, using sports as an analogy to race. No, because the writing is, to me was very clear. It felt like when I was watching it that, um, it made me reflect on myself. It made me reflect on the other films, right? It made me think about um, the Hispanic community, the Black community, um, and how that affect how, how the white community is um, ignoring or looking through, like how we have to decenter them, you know, decolonize that stuff so we can get to us. I thought it was great to hear that. I wanted to hear a little bit about. Um, you definitely finish um, your thought, but I wanted to hear a little bit about the mother, right? I don't ever know much about Asian mothers and how they feel and, you know, what they're, um, of course, a mother is a mother is a mother supporting their child, but just hearing her, I was like, oh, you know what I mean? Oh, I'm, I'm seeing, I'm getting into their living room. I'm getting into their house where I'm, I, that's not typically a place where I feel like um, I am. Can you talk a little bit about well, that? It was, it was important to me to, you know, to, if you're going to tell a story about, you know, one year per person, you're going to, you know, it's also analog, analogous to my mother and my role and her role in my life, right? Um, you want to talk about family. Family is very important. So that's also why I put her in there. And as a mother who is a, who is an immigrant, she may or may not understand everything that is going on in America. She just, you know, a lot of immigrants come to this country they are in search of this American dream. You know, and I think this mother also sees her son that work hard, you're gonna make it, you are better than this. You, you will, you know, she may not understand the dynamics, but even, even so like my mother who is now older now, when she came to this country, she didn't understand the dynamics of race. You know, she didn't, mm -hmm. she just came. She didn't understand the black struggle. Like, and then me being born here and being born in, in, and raised predominantly in a black and Latino environment, which is why I am the way I am. I'm very proud of it. Um, I've been able to, to inform her and, and have her understand. So now she's in a better place to understand. Even my father, before he passed, understood because we used to have arguments about it. You know, they would say, you know, kind of like race is not an issue. I was like, yes, it is, right? It's a very important, this is a black and white, you know, just like your film, this is a black and white world. And when you come yeah. to this country as an immigrant, you have to make a choice, especially if you're not white. You have to make a choice. Are you supporting the system or are you not supporting the system? If you're not supporting the system, you have to be on the side of, you know, black black uh, culture and also supporting the struggle for them, right? Mm -hmm. So the liberation, you know, of that, you have to. If you're not, you're against it. You're supporting it. So, and that's, again, I'm a little different as an Asian American, but it's mm -hmm. also part of my voice as an Asian American mm -hmm. filmmaker is I, I come into every project with that knowledge. And no matter what I'm, whatever, what I'm directing, whether it's a fantasy, whatever, I still come in that with that knowledge of this is who I am, even when I'm walking on a set on, and most of these sets are predominantly white. Yeah. Right? The crews yeah. are predominantly white. That's right. You know, and, um, and in our, and in, in case of this film, you know, we had a very small crew as well, like you know, six people as well or something. And 
besides the actors, but thank God my crew was very diverse. We had everything in there. My crew had everything. White, Latino, Asian, Black. We had a, we had a good, you know, just a good crew that cared about the project. And that was, that's very important to me to bring along people that support the vision, you know, and, and that's represent something the world. Yeah, that's something that's really prevalent in all of you all, like D May, like we're, you know, pulling this um, Black woman story in. Um, Francisco, you know, you put in your story at the Edgar, you telling a, a, a Black story, talking about Black and white and trying to understand it. Lisa, you using white characters to tell this to white people and white characters to tell your story. I think that's really important, right? Because somehow in there is that thing I was taught that I kind of started with about that decolonization of who's going to tell whose story so we can all move forward. And Bobby, I have to, you know, my my personal belief is like when we get free, we all get free. You know, the the black Correct. liberation Correct. based on yeah. what happened to us in this country is helping yeah. to everybody. You well, know, that you know. So yeah, with that being said, it's like if someone is about black liberation or even you know pro Asian, it doesn't mean you're anti white. It means you are right. pro humanity. That's what we have to understand, and that's what people that might feel defensive about it have to understand, no, we're trying to heal the world. Because in order to have love in the world, we have to stop thinking of the differences, but we have to acknowledge the problem first before we can get rid of it. So if you don't acknowledge it exists, it's not gonna go away. It just, it sees inside you. So I think a lot of our jobs as filmmakers is to show authentic, I don't like that word, but it's, it's the right word, authentic stories of humanity of whoever we are, whether we're black, white, Asian, Mexican, whoever we are, we have or indigenous, we have to show the humanity of the people so that when kids watch these films and the next generation of us are, are, are growing up, they see those other faces and see them as human. Right? Right. Because racism right. is racism is taught. It's taught in schools, it's taught in the Midwest, hey. it's taught in the South, it's taught in the schools. You know, I've spoken to some teachers and they told me that it is taught. It's in the books, it's in the mm -hmm. curriculum especially in those mm -hmm. white areas down south and Midwest, it is taught. Oh, they are taught these kids are, are, are brainwashed to believe that, that they are superior. And it's, that has to change. That has to change. We have to rework that. And that's what yeah. as media, media and creatives, we have to understand the power that we have to do that. I think I said this on another panel, but it's true. Like, look at the news. They're controlling our thoughts. Well, yeah. as, as creatives, <laughs> as independent creators, we also have to take control of that and create our own new narratives that can combat combat that truthfully you know so yeah and, and um i want to i think that's a good place to kind of wrap us up right as as we as we end this segment that is so diverse and how you all have so beautifully told each and every single one of your stories um if i can just as a sign off if we can just pass the mic, um, if I can pass the mic to each of you and just say, uh, and ask you, um, what's something you'd like to say to another player, just something inspirational for another playwright or filmmaker so that when they see your story, they know they can, they can, they can move forward and have that same voice. You know, if you have something inspirational to say, uh, I'm gonna pass the mic to D May, if we can take like, you know, 10 seconds and just give us a little blurt before we end. Wow. Um, uh, I, I think that you learn by doing, you get better each time you do. And if you, um, it really helps if you learn how to write grant proposals, you know, and, and learn how to fund yourself so that you have that independence. I've always believed in independence in your creativity and uh, I just want to be able to um, inspire that because I really believe that if you have an idea, you can fund it mm -hmm. and you can meet people that will help you follow your dream. And so you just look out for that. And then when you have a chance, you help other people, you know, you lift up yeah. whoever you can and encourage them to create. So that's my two cents. Thank about you. That. I'm going to let you pass the mic. Um, uh, Lisa, do you want to, uh, yeah. <laughs> give your inspiration? <laughs> Thank you. I, I think my inspiration is being around like-minded people 
and people that raise my vibration. So when I'm surrounded with people like that, like the director, Jennifer Lanier was amazing. Then I'm able to move forward and, and uh, dream big. Excellent. I'm gonna let you pass the mic, Lisa. I'm gonna pass the mic to Bobby. Oh, I'm still on. Hey, <laughs> uh, sure. Uh, inspiration is everything to me. And I, I think part of who I am is I like to inspire everybody around me. So I would say write your stories. I mean, if you're a playwright or creative or filmmaker, write your stories, do it. You know, don't, you know, and you're right. Keep doing it more than once because you're going to get better at it. You know, we are in a time when we can use our phones to create films. We, we, when I started, we couldn't do that. It was, it was a very high entry point back in the day just to enter film but now with our cell phones we can create a little you know a little film that can impact the world even on youtube or tiktok right we have power now so we should keep on doing that and uh and if you agree if you're an actor you know keep on acting practice do monologue study if you can't take classes read books practice your craft a lot of a lot of people come to me and say i want to be in your film are you studying acting are you are you trying to work on it on your own? Mm -hmm. If you are, great. I will, I will talk to you. But if you're not, I'm going to tell you to just do the work, study the craft, because that's it right. is a craft and we must respect that craft. You know, yeah. that's it. Mm -hmm. Oh, I'll pass it Thank to you. Uh, 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 Francisco. Great. Thank you. Um, I would say it's okay to be an artist. Call yourself an artist. Take pride in that. A lot of times I feel like for what whatever reason we're we're afraid to claim who we are i'm a filmmaker i'm a playwright i'm a director and i don't know if that's just because of like you know all of those years of like systematic racism that people tell us that you can't do this but you can so i would say just demystify that whole idea of like you know oh i can't make a film just like bobby was saying well you, you know you you have an iphone that's a start or or i can't act well take some classes you know, uh, put it out there. And that's what I say to like all my acting students that I have is just, you know, put it out there. And if what you're doing, um, if, if, if there is that, that love and that passion that you have for what you're doing, people are attracted to that. And yeah. people will be attracted to the work you're doing. So, yeah. And I'm gonna pass it to Edgar. Well, um, one of the things that I'm trying to do in my practice and I was trying to tell people is to experiment, to like try new things and then don't, don't get caught up on just the, the trends or where the things are, are going. You know, I think like if you have a, a point of view or, or a story or anything that you want to say, I think like uh, don't be afraid to come out and say it and then do it. Even if it's a film, a playwright or anything, you know, because like having different voices and having different point of view is just gonna make uh, everyone uh, better in the long term. We'll have different point, you know, different products and different materials and everything kind of evolves to something else. And I think like having like in this panel of diversity, having different point of views and, uh, and I think that just like increases and they make it like, just like, life more fun you know <laughs> and, mm -hmm. and that would say like if anything is experiment and, and do it you know like try to like if you actually um you know don't worry so much if it's going to be good or bad i mean everybody has to start at some point and then like through time through doing you're going to get better and you're going to have better and better products and hopefully you know uh some people will like it but some people don't but but it's still you have a product and you feel proud of it that's i think that's kind of like the main the main goals, you know, so. Yes. Uh, thank you. Thank you so much, all of my filmmakers here. Thank you so much. We want to thank the Pacific Northwest Multicultural Film Festival uh, Festival for uh, lifting out your voices. It has been so impactful. I was so moved by each and every single one of your films in so many different ways. And I just, and kudos to all of you. <laughs> yeah, thank um, you. It's been a lot of fun. <laughs> Yes. Tim, thank you so much for lifting me up and supporting me at this time uh, with everybody. Uh, thank you for the Zoom vibes, everybody. <laughs> and so um, with that, I want to close out, have everybody wave to the camera, wave, Bye. wave. Bye. Thank you, guys. Thank Bye. You.